Good morning, Virginia. This is WGFW 88.7 on the FM dial. Drake's Branch, Virginia. The time is 9.15. This is Storytime brought to you by Safe Haven Ministries. I am your host, Brother D. As always, let us begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our many blessings. Father, we ask that you be with those that are traveling today. Please keep them safe. Father, if we get ready to start summer school tomorrow, please let us remember to be looking for the orange buses once again. Be looking for them big yellow buses, folks. Father, help us to remember. Be safe. Be kind. Be more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. Duh, Brother D, what are we going to do today? <laughs> what are we going to do today? Dog, calm down. I've already told you several times what we're going to be talking about. Duh, uh oh, we're going to be talking about water, and that means bath, and uh, not necessarily, but yes, we're going to be talking about water. I'm going to borrow a little something from the amazing facts, folks. The Jordan River begins near Mount Hare. Herman, and it meanders about 156 miles before ending at the Dead Sea. Now, at its widest, the Jordan is about 20 yards across. Now, south of the Sea of Galilee, the river basically is highly polluted, and some environments feel that part of the river is even in danger of dying. Duh. But uh, the Dead Sea, duh, everything flows in, but nothing flows out. So, you know. That's just it, though. The Jordan River, which has been flowing for millennia, is one of the best-known waterways in the world. Each year, it is visited by thousands of Christian pilgrims from all over the world. You stop and think, the children of Israel had a long history with the Jordan. It was the site of many miracles. Uh, yeah, it was. And one of these miracles occurred under Joshua's leadership, didn't it, Brother Day? That's right, though. The Ark of the Covenant was carried over to Jordan. Now, here's the thing. When the priests started walking up to the Jordan, they just kept walking. And as their feet touched near the water, the river receded. And it became dry land until all the people had crossed over. Duh, that shows that God's always leading the way. That's right, though. Now, you stop and think about this. Though he was sinless, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan. When he come up from the water, the symbol of the Spirit of the Lord miraculously descended upon him, and the Father voiced the approval of his Son. Duh. Yeah, that leads to the question. If he was sinless, why was Jesus baptized? That's just it, dog. He was leading the way for us. He was setting an example. And he told John the Baptist that, to suffer it so. Now, baptism is important. It's a powerful symbol for death and resurrection. A person who's baptized dies to the old destructive way of their life and is resurrected to a new victorious life in Christ. Duh. Uh, Mark 1, uh, verses 9 through 11 says it this way, Brother D. Uh, Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passes over before you into Jordan. <laughs> well, no, that's Joshua 3, 11, though. Duh, okay. I, wait a minute. Here it is. It says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by, of John in Jordan. And straight coming out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there was a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That's right, dog. Now you got it right. That's Mark 1, verses 9 through 11. And today's story basically is about the Jordan. Duh, yeah, yeah. And they, they several major characters in here, and one of them we don't even know what her name is. That's right, though. It comes from the Bible. It comes from the Old Testament, Second Kings chapter five. Now, verse one says this. It says, "Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable." Because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria, and he was also a mighty man in valor, but he was also a leper. 
dying. That, that wasn't good back then, was it, Brother D? No, it wasn't. You know, here he was, basically, it says he was captain of the host. That means he was a great general. He led the armies to victory for his king and everything. Now, the, it says the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away a captive out of the land of Israel, a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Duh. Okay, this is the second person in this story, right? That's right, though. Actually, there's more than the four we're going to be talking about, but there's four main ones. Now, here's the thing. She was basically a handmaiden for Naaman's wife. She would be considered a maid, you know. She helped her get dressed. She cleaned up behind her. You know, she basically did everything for her and everything. But here this little girl is, you know, she's a captive in a foreign land. You know, she's a child of God, but she's in a land where they don't worship God. They worship idols and Lord knew what else they were worshiping back then. But here's the thing. She says to her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Duh, what the... Wait a minute. Basically, what she's telling her mistress is, if your husband was with with the prophet in Samaria and everything, God would have the prophet heal him of his leprosy. Duh. So he, even even though she was in this what amounted to a heathen home, she was basically a strong witness for the power of God. And that was due to her early home training, wasn't it, Brother D? That's right. You see, that's the thing. Her mother and father had instilled in her a trust and a love for God. And that example they set, she carried. And she was basically being a witness to these folks who didn't know God. Now, while she was talking to her mistress, one of the other servants heard. And he went and told Naaman and everything. And he told Naaman, Naaman about this little maid and everything and what was going on in the land of Israel in Samaria. So the king of Syria heard what was going on and he told Naaman, you need to go. And I'll even send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman, he departed and he took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. Duh. Basically, he went to pay to get himself healed, didn't he, Brother D? That's right, though. And that's the thing. When he brought the letter to the king of Israel, you know, he told him, he said, Now, this letter has come to you. Behold, I'm, you know, as the king of Israel is reading it, he's like, I have therefore sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou may recover him of his leprosy. Duh. Yeah, I can imagine the king of Israel's look on his face. Well, that's just it. The king of Israel read the letter, and basically it says he rent his clothes. Uh, you mean he pulled on and tore them and everything. That's right. And that's when he looked at Naaman and he said, Am I God to kill and to make a lie? You know, what? what is this man who sent, sent, sent you unto me? You know, how am I supposed to recover you of your leprosy? How, how am I supposed to restore you? You know, it seems that your king is seeking a quarrel against me. Duh. Well, that's where the that's where the next figure in the, comes in, and it's the fourth of the main characters, isn't it, Brother D? Actually, dog, it's the third one in the main characters, and this is who comes in, Elisha. Now he was a man of God, and he heard what had happened with the king of Israel and everything, and he basically sent a message to the king saying. Why have you rent your clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Duh. Yeah, and that's the thing. Elijah, he, 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 he had a double portion of, of the Holy Spirit and everything because he got it when Elijah was taken up by the fiery chariot. That's right, dog. He'd been a student of Elijah, and he... When Elijah asked him what he could do for him, he says, I want a double portion of the Holy Spirit so I could be more like you. So he got his 
he got what he asked for, and he was out there doing what God sent him to do. Duh, that's the thing. So when the word came, what happened? Well, that's just it. The word came, and they told Naaman. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot, and basically he stood at the door of the house of Elijah. Now, Elijah sent a messenger out unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall come back again to thee, and you shall be clean of this disease. Duh. Go wash in the Jordan. All you got to do is basically take it, dip yourself seven times, and get a real good bath. That's right, but here's the thing. You got to stop and think about it. Remember what we said earlier about the Jordan? Uh, it is kind of a muddy river, isn't it? That's right, dog. You see, Naaman was very rough, and basically he started to go away mad. And he, t he told a couple of his servants, he says, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the places where I'm a leper and help me to recover from this leprosy. Duh. That's the thing. He, he he was expecting something great and mighty to happen, wasn't he? Well, that's just it. It wasn't just that. He he went on to say, Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? And he was really getting ready to turn and leave, and he started walking back to his chariot. He was in a rage. Duh. Yep, but he couple of his servants come up and they start speaking to him and telling him to calm down. That's right. They told him, my father, if the prophet had bid you to do something really great, some great thing, would you not have done it? How much is it rather than that he said to you, wash and be clean? Uh, yeah, he was having a real problem with the fact that the, <laughs> the, Jordan, the Jordan was known to be a very muddy river and everything else. That's right, dog. And once again, you got to stop and think. A little bit of an ego was in play here because you got to remember he was a mighty man of valor. He was a warrior through and through. He had led his king's armies into battles and basically never been defeated. Duh, that's the thing. But his servants got him calmed down, didn't they, Brother D? That's right, dog. His servants got him calmed down, and that's the thing. You stop and think about it. Because once he got calmed down, he took himself on down to the Jordan. Duh. Yep. And he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, didn't he, Brother D? That's right. According to the saying of the man of God. And the funny thing is, you know what happened next. Duh. His flesh became again like it was the flesh of a little child and he was clean. That's right, dog. Because I can tell you something. When, back then, when you had leprosy, you were basically a, an outcast. The only reason Naaman wasn't completely an outcast was because of who he was. He was a mighty man of valor. He was the captain of the king's host. But you stop and think, because of his leprosy and the fact that, you know, it was considered highly contagious, he didn't... He wasn't able to be near like his wife. He couldn't be near anybody in his household. He basically, everybody else lived in the main house and he lived in a little house off to the side probably. You know, it was one of those things. This, this was a disease that was looked down upon by many. And, you know, because at that time they didn't really know of any way to cure it. Duh. Yeah, but Elijah had the answer and everything, and, and all he told him what to do. Well, he told him what God told Elijah to tell him. You know, and that's the thing. Now, once once he dipped himself into Jordan, and he, he got healed, what did he do next? Duh, that's simple. He returned to the man of God, and he and all of his all the men that he had with him, all his company and everything, and they stood before Elijah, and Naaman said to him, Behold, now I know there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. That's right. 
He was basically telling him, you know, I've got all this stuff here. I want to pay you. And basically what happened? That's when Elijah said, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged, Naaman urged him to take it. But Elijah refused. That's right, Elijah refused. Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offerings nor sacrifices unto other gods, but only unto the Lord. That's right. That's the thing. Now, here's the thing. Naaman also asked this. He asked him, In this thing, the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Ramon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Ramon, when I bow down myself in the house of Ramon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. And Elijah basically told him to go in peace. So Naaman departed and basically started off. It says, departed from him a little way. Duh. Yeah, and that's where the fourth main character comes into play here, isn't it, Brother D? That's right. That's where your fourth main character comes in. You stop and think about it. Elijah, he didn't want anything. He wasn't taking anything because it was God that did the healing. And here he was, you know, by showing that he didn't, he wasn't doing it for profit. Imagine the powerful witness he was making for God. Duh, I never thought about it, but you're right. He he was showing them that that, that God is, God is great, and, and you don't buy things from God. God. It's a gift from God. That's right. But here's the problem. Greed reared its ugly little head in a certain form. Duh. That's right. It was Jehazi, the servant of Elijah, <laughs> the man of God. That's right. Elijah was a man of God. Jehazi was his servant. But Jehazi, he had that problem. You know, he, he had the problem a lot of us had. He saw everything that Naaman was offering him, you know, was offered to Elijah, and he wanted it. Or at least he thought to get part of it. Because he thought to himself, Behold, my master has spared Naaman this Syrian and is not receiving anything at his hands that which he has brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. Duh, Jazzy wasn't thinking, was he, Brother D? No, he wasn't thinking in the right way. He was he was thinking only of himself. He he figured he was going to get some gain out of it one way or the other. Duh. So Jehazi followed after Naaman. That's right, dog. Now, when Naaman saw him running after him, he basically stepped down from his chariot to meet him. And the first question he asked is, all well? He was thinking that Jehazi was coming after him. Something might have happened to Elijah and everything. And Jehazi told him, all is well. My master has sent me, saying, Behold, even now there have, there have come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garment. Now, basically Jehazi's trying to get something for himself. He's basically lying to Naaman. And he's lying in the name of Elisha. And Naaman said, be content, take two talents, and he urged him, and he basically bound up the two talents of silver in two bags, and he gave him two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants, and they bare them before him. <clears throat> now, that's the thing. When he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in, you know, in the house. Basically, he went and hit them, and he told the man, go on catch up with your master and they departed and here's the thing when he went inside suddenly he found himself standing for Elijah and Elijah already knew what was going on God had given him a little vision of what had been happening behind his back and he asked Jehazi whence comest thou and basically what happened 
the Jehazi tried to lie. He said, thy servant has went nowhere. That's right, though. But, you know, Elijah basically told him, I already know what you're doing. He said, when you went out, my heart was with you. When the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee. And, you know, is it the time to receive money and to receive garments and olive vineyards and wine yards and sheep and oxen and manservants and maidservants? You know, basically he's rebuking Jehazi for taking something that, you know, Elijah had already said he didn't want. Uh, that's the whole problem, Brother D. He, Elijah, Elijah knew that, you know, he he knew what he was doing. He knew that Naaman would really be having his mind focused on the God who healed him. That's right. And here's the thing. After Elijah had said, no, I don't want it, Jehazi went and got it. So you can imagine what Naaman was thinking. He was thinking, well, okay. He didn't want to do it in front of anybody, so he sends a servant out, out here. He sends this servant to come get this stuff. You know, basically, Jehazi took away from the glory of God. Duh. And that's that thing. He, he didn't stop and think, you know. <laughs> what, what you do behind other people's backs <laughs> still happens in front of God's eyes. <laughs> that's right, dog. He wasn't thinking about that. He didn't stop to think that you know, Elijah with that double portion of the Holy Spirit would know that the minute Jehazi left and everything. And you think that his thoughts wasn't so strong that it, it didn't pervade everything that was going on around there? You know, when you get greedy, it kind of rolls off of you. Duh, yeah, and well, that's the thing. He got greedy and he, he paid a price before it was over with, didn't he, Brother D? That's right. That's one of the things. Elijah told him, The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall clean unto you, and it will be unto your children forever. And when Jehazi went out from the presence of Elijah, he was a leper, and he was white as snow. Duh. That's the thing. The leprosy, it causes your skin to turn white and to basically peel off and it, it's a rotting disease. That's right. But you stop and think. Jehazi basically brought a curse upon both him and his children. You know, that's the thing. This, this is not a good thing. You know, but he took away he took away what should have been the glory of God. And he did it for what? A little bit of silver and a couple of changes of clothes? You know, the... Well, there's other stories in the Bible where somebody did, saw something that they were, wasn't supposed to touch or take, and they did it. That's right, though. There's several stories like that where God said, don't do this, or, you know, one of God's servants said, we're not going to do this, but somebody else took it upon themselves to, you know, and that was the thing. But you stop and think, that young girl, we don't even know her name. She basically had the faith. She knew that Elijah was there. She knew that Elijah would heal Naaman. She trusted in God. And she trusted in God so much that her very faith convinced others. And that convinced Naaman to go. But at the same time, you stop and think. All it took was one person like Jehazi to basically mar what was done. You know, a miracle was performed. God done a great thing for Naaman. But Jehazi took away from that miracle in that he was more concerned for himself. And that's the thing. When we're truly following Jesus, we worry more about those around us and how we can help them than how we can help ourselves. Duh, that's the problem with the world today, Brother D. Too many people more worried about self than they are about helping others. That's right, dog. But you stop and think about it this way. Satan, he doesn't always try to, you know, make us sin. 
what he does, he tries to get us not to trust in God. Because you stop and think about it. When Satan tempted Eve, it wasn't, you know, he tempted her and Adam to try to kill somebody or anything else. All he did was tempted them to basically convince them not to trust God, not to trust God's Word. You know, there's many today that do not open their Bibles. I had a person tell me just last week that they don't open their Bibles, they don't study their Bibles. Their pastor tells them all they need to know. Well, their pastor's human, just like you or me. And you need to be opening and studying your Bible yourself because you miss what truly is the meaning. You stop and think there were six characters in this story. Four of them were main characters. The one that really stands out is the one who wasn't named. She was the one who had all the faith to convince one man to go and trust the prophet of God. Duh. That's the thing. If we're going, if we're going to do what we're supposed to do, we got to learn to trust God and to have faith, and have the faith of a little child. That's right, though. That's the thing. But how many times do we do that? How many times have we been more like Jehazi, trying to see what we can get ahead? You know, what we can get out of it, instead of worrying about, you know, how we can help somebody else. So we need to stop and we need to think. This world is not going to get any better until Jesus comes back, but we can do our level best to be leading people to Jesus so that when Jesus comes back, they'll be ready. And that's the thing. You know, we can work to make it our little portion of the world a better place, but Satan's always going to be striving against us. So we need to be armed and we need to be ready. And to be armed, we need to have the Word of God. And to be ready, we need to have the faith of that young maid that she had in God. And we need to have that trust. Now, let us end with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for our many blessings. We thank you for your Word that you've given us in the form of your Holy Bible. Father, we know it is inspired by the Holy Spirit that while it was written by many different men, that pen was basically being held in your hand as they wrote. Father, we are grateful for all of our many blessings. The first one began when we opened our eyes this morning. Father, please, we ask that you be with our first responders, the firefighters, the EMTs, the law enforcement officers, doctors, nurses, our military personnel, those that serve and protect us and keep us safe. Father, we have some friends that are working both in Syria and in Ukraine. They're medical people, doctors and nurses. One of them is a general who's trying to organize more hospitals. Father, please be with them. Help them as they work through this crisis that Satan has started. Father, we ask that you be with their families. Two of them have asked for special prayer for their family members because of incidents that have happened here at home. And they are not able to come home to be with their family members. But we ask you, touch the physicians. Let them be great in their healing. Father, so many out here today are in need of the healing touch, whether it be physical, mental, spiritual. We ask you reach out with your Holy Spirit and touch all in the sound of my voice today. Father, we are so grateful just to be alive. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Duh, folks, if you like what you hear on the radio, you, you can call us at 434-390-5981. That's right, folks, or you can email us at emtx3xl at gmail.com. Again, that is E-M-T-X-3-X-L at gmail.com. Folks, we like to remind everybody, WGFW is a Christian radio station, and it needs your support. Please send your donations to God's Final Call and Warning, P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia, 24531. Again, that's God's Final Call and Warning, P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia, 24531. 
done, folks. Don't forget, if you don't want to write God's final call and warning, put GFCW. That's GFCW, not the station's call letters. That's right, though. And once again, we'd like to thank Safe Haven Ministries for sponsoring Storytime. Safe Haven Ministries also sponsors Safe Haven Student Center, located in the shops at College Park. Guys, if you need to get your virtual studies done, we got free Wi-Fi, free snacks, free drinks, nothing costs. We have game tables, ping pong, foosball, air hockey, pool table. We got what you need to get your studying done or just to be able to relax. No drinking, no drugs, no smoking, no vaping, no foul language, most of all, no pressure. Once again, folks, this is WGFW. 88.7 on your FM dial, Drake's Branch, Virginia. The time is 9.45. We return you to the regular broadcast. Duh, folks, don't forget, join us next Sunday morning at 9.15 as we bring you another episode of Storytime. May your week be blessed.